Hey friends, this is Laura with Laura B. Floss Tube. I just decided that I am going to try to put together kind of a compilation of videos of how I prepare for the applique quilts that I do. Um, designer Lori Holt is the one that I do a lot of her applique quilts. And I have picked up a lot of tips and tricks along the way. And I shared some of those um, in a different video on just how I do the applique itself and how I decide um, which layers to stitch first and things like that. But I thought you also might be interested in some prep work because prep work can either save you or defeat you. And so I'd like to give you some tips on what I do and maybe to help you too. Okay, so first things first. Um, normally what I do is I order a kit and I've purchased kits from a few different places. Um, the last few kits I've purchased have been from Fat Quarter Shop. And I do that because I really like the way they put their kits together. Um, they typically, if it's like a third of a yard or a half a yard or, you know, whatever the pattern is calling for, they typically, typically give you a little bit more than that. And it's because Kimberly likes to starch all of her fabrics. So uh, when you start fabrics, they shrink a little bit. So I think just as a company, they've decided that they do a little more than necessary, which is really helpful when you start cutting your pieces um, for any of the quilts, just in case you make a mistake. So I'm gonna show you my supplies first and go over that. And then we'll just move along as I move along. And I'm not very far with this, so um, we will venture into this together. All right, so first of all, for the, um, I'm working on the hometown sew along, which this one begins September 18th of 2023. Um, all of the instructions for this quilt, for sewing the quilt itself will be on Lori's blog, which is beinmybonnet.blogspot.com. And um, so I got the sew along guide with my kit from Fat Quarter Shop. I do have the kit and it came in this really nice um, white cardboard box. It has a cute little hometown label on, on top, which is really cool. The first thing I do when I get my kit is I look at the sew along guide and I start putting my fabrics in order. Now this is another thing that I love about Fat Quarter Shop because, and this guide is free on the Raleigh Lake um, website, so I'm not showing you anything that you can't get for free. So here is their cutting guide. So I use this cutting guide and I order my fabrics in the box by the uh, order of the cutting guide. Now one thing that I have noticed and I love about Fat Quarter Shop kits is that the fabrics are pretty much in the order of the cutting guide in your kit. So that's really helpful. Um, I do go ahead and go through all of them and make sure everything is there and um, put them, just double check, make sure everything is in the right order for me. Because that really will speed up your cutting progress um, if your fabrics are in the right order. You don't have to keep searching and searching and searching. Now, with that being said, I do cut all of my fabrics in order of the cutting guide and I then divide them up into baggies. So another item that you will need are the Sew Simple Shapes, and these are just my Sew Simple Shapes. Um, what I do with all of mine when I get them, again, just to make sure, and I'm so glad I did this, because this time when I received the Sew Simple Shapes, the bag that it came in was torn on the side, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if all the shapes are in there, and there were they were not. So I was missing two of them, so I worked, um, I actually just, um, talked to the seller and sent a replacement out and got the shapes out of it that I needed and then sent the original set back. So what I do is I put them on a library ring and I use, I use a scrapbook a lot. So I have a, a tool called the crop -a dial and let me grab that so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I have this tool called a crop -a dial and it's really just a glorified um, paper punch um, and hole punch. And it's got this really nice um, tool on this side that you put your your shape into and then you just punch your hole. But it's really kind of heavy duty. So it will go through about five or six of these templates at the same time, which really is kind of helpful. So what I do is I go through and I put all of my shapes in numerical order. And this helps when I go to trace them because then everything is in numerical order. It also helps just in case the guide or my tracing is wrong and I missed one, I need an extra one, I lost one, whatever happened. Uh, it really makes it 
a lot faster for me to find that shape in my ring. So then I put these on a ring and then these go into, I have a binder and let me show you that. I have a three ring binder. I actually have three of these and on the spine I just put which um, sets are in there. And then what I've done is I got these really heavy duty plastic Velcro shutting envelopes from Amazon and you, um, I punched the three holes in the sides and then put one set of shapes in each one of these little pockets. So then when I'm done with hometown, they will go in their envelope and they will go into the closet and they're there in case I need them for another project, which I have went back and used my so simple shapes, um, and other projects. So don't think that it's like a one and done type thing. Um, you definitely can use them for other things too. So. Here's my So Simple Shapes, my cutting guide that I told you about, my fabric that's in the box over here stacked in order. The first thing I do is I use the cutting guide and her schedule and I turn it into kind of like a little labeling system. So I put, and for hometown there are 12 blocks and then there are 40 pieced blocks. So I have put the 12 blocks and the name and the date that they're going to be coming out. And that comes directly from the cutting guide. It's like page one, I think, of the cutting guide for the hometown schedule. Let me show you that. So that's exactly where I got that information. And I print these. This one is on just typing paper, but I print these on a label sheet because what I do <laughs> And this is a lot of information, so you'll probably want to rewind and go, what is she talking about? But it's all good. Um, I print a set of those onto a label sheet, and then I have Ziploc baggies, one for each block, right? So then as I'm going through my cutting guide, it will tell you this is shape, whatever, far, whatever block. So I find that bag, and I put the shape in the or I put the fabric in the correct bag and then I also find the shapes and I put those in the bag so when I'm done with my cutting I have all my fabric and all my interfacing cut and ready to go for the entire so long so then when she puts her instructions up on the blog all I have to do is grab that blocks bag so if I'm working on the first block I would grab the bag for the flag house and um, I have all my fabric, all my Pellon, everything is there. All I'm doing is stitching, flipping, and appliquing. So it really does speed up your sewing process. Definitely does um, add some time into the beginning for cutting and preparing. Uh, I typically use, I, I mean, honestly, I typically spend around six to eight hours preparing for any of these sew alongs. And that's not uncommon um, for any of the quilts that I've done with her. Okay. So I also have all of these numbers, right? And those are for the 40 pieced blocks. What I'll do, what I will do with those is I will cut each one of those numbers out and I'll use a binder clip, binding clip, sorry. And as I cut the pieces for those blocks, I will clip those all together and I will put those into another one of these um, plastic organizing tubs to keep those set. Um, separated and ready for me for whenever I sew those up. All right, so that's my prep work, right? I was like, my fabrics are in order. My cutting guide is in a binder ready for me. Um, I have my labels on my bags. My bags are in a project tote ready for me for cutting. And then the first thing I have started doing before I start cutting fabric is I trace all of my so simple shapes. So at the back of your cutting guide, you're going to find the so simple shapes and it tells you a number for each one of those that you need. It's not always accurate. Okay. So just know that, um, don't like, you know, use the so simple shapes and then put them where you can't find them. You know, you know, one of those safe spots that you put things when you're done with it. Don't do that because you may need them again. So make sure that you do keep that in mind as you're going through your cutting guide um, that, you know, you might run across something that says you need two and you only have one of that shape traced. Um, just trace another one, throw it in the bag. I'm sure it'll be fine. And you may find out more things when she does her blog post. I know with the Bee Vintage quilt, there were a couple things that she changed like halfway through the quilt, the sew along. And just, you know, be prepared for those types of um, discrepancies as you go along if you do pre-cut and prepare all of your cut stuff in advance. 
Okay, so what I where I have spent my time the last day or so, and this isn't like 24 hours. This is, you know, as I had time. The first thing I did was I went through the cutting guide and I traced all of the so simple shapes. So I have this roll of interfacing that has all of those shapes on it. And then when I am going through the cutting guide, um, I will see, oh, this is, I need this shape for this piece of fabric and I'll go ahead and cut that shape out with the fabric and put it in the appropriate bag as I go through the guide. So that's kind of where I'm at um, up until right now for my prep work. And so the idea is I will be cutting a couple of fabrics and just showing you how I sort those and how that process works. And I think that will probably get you on the road to um, being organized and prepared for your next so long that you're doing with um, the applique quilts that Lori Holt has designed. Okay, so let's cut some stuff, right? Um, I have actually cut several of the fabrics already and I have those kind of piled up here. You can't really see them, but they're there, I promise. Um, and I've pulled out the next fabric in the um, kit that I need to cut. And that's this blue denim butterfield. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the cutting guide and I'm gonna cut all the pieces I need match those up with the interfacing pieces or put them on my board that has the um, 40 piece blocks and separate those into their baggies. So let's just get cutting and I'll try to talk through while I do this just to hopefully give you a few tips and tricks along the way. All right, so I, again, this is all available, the free cutting guide on Riley Blake's website. Um, that's what I'm working with. I'm on page seven, um, doing the denim Butterfield fat quarter. So the first, thing. okay, one and a quarter by five. So I'm just going to tell you that I, um, typically cut those a little longer just because I like to point, this is for the straight bias tape for the pineapple house. Um, I like to point the one in so it's easier to run through my bias tape maker. So I usually cut these about an inch longer. So I'm going to go ahead and do one and a quarter by six. And I'm just going to line that up on my, um, with my ruler. I'm sure that's really exciting for you. Okay. And because this is on the pinked edge, um, I cut that a little bigger because you don't want, I don't want to have to try to run pinking edge through my bias tape maker. All right. So that's scrap. And then I have, okay, so this is, I think this is probably the first time I've cut this size. I have several um, bias tapes that I need to make. And I just put these strips together and I clip them together in the same size. So then once I get all my cutting done, I'll make my bias tape and they're sorted by size already. So I can just um, run them all through my bias tape makers at once. So let me just start another little clip because this is a new size. And that way I know that that's a, um, a different size. All right, so the next thing, two and a half by six and a half, two of those. And you literally just go down through the um, cutting guide and make your cuts. Now, I will also tell you that um, I sometimes cut mine a little bigger because I like a little more wiggle room. I've never had a problem with any of the fabrics, um, like running out of any of the fabrics or anything like that. Okay, so I know this is the first cut that I've had to, I have to do. So that's gonna go right here on my mat and I'm gonna continue cutting. I need another two and a half by five. And I'm probably just gonna speed the video up here for the rest of my cutting and then we will meet back when I am matching them up.
Okay, so I have all those cut. Um, one thing that I would point out is, especially on this quilt, since there are pieced blocks and applique blocks, um, in the cutting guide it will tell you that it's far like number 15 or number 29 or whatever. Those are the piece blocks. So your cutting on those matter. You want to be accurate for cutting those pieces because you're piecing a block together, right? So make sure those are accurate. So if it says one and a half by one and a half, make sure you cut it one and a half by one and a half. The other pieces that are for applique, those are the ones I usually cut a little larger or I don't really worry about exact measurements on those. As long as I have the minimum of what they list, then I know it's going to be fine when I go to applique that piece into my quilt. All right, so I do have all of those pieces cut, and I laid them out in order of the cutting guide on my um, mat here. So all I have to do now is go back, look to see what um, applique shape those are, and match those up with the pile, and then put them in the baggies. All right, so let's do that. All of my interfacing it off to the side. So I'm gonna probably get up and grab the ones I need and I'll come back and tell you what I'm, what I'm doing. The first one that I noticed um, is that I needed to reverse one of the shapes, which I didn't do that when I traced them because I didn't know that, right? So on that one, I just wrote use reverse. So that way I know when I go to sew it, it will um, be on the right side and the right angle. Okay, so I have all of those matched up, and what I'm gonna do now is just put them in the appropriate bags. Um, the first set of shapes go in the pineapple house, so I'm just gonna stand up, I'll move the camera a little bit so I'm not out of frame, um, and put these where they're supposed to be. Okay, so remember the list that I showed you earlier that I made? Um, I have a copy of that on my binder here. And so I can like quickly reference and say, okay, well, this is the pineapple house. That's bag number three. So here's bag number three and they go right in here. And like I said, I have done some of these already. So here's my bag. This is for the first block. Um, I have it labeled flag house with a one on it. And the pieces that I've cut so far are already in here. And then I leave these bags in order in my project keeper. Um, and then I can just quickly flip through and throw them in the right bag and keep moving. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do the rest of these. Okay, so the... The rest of the pieces that I have on my cutting mat right now are all for pieced blocks. So I have all of my piece blocks on my design boards here and um, they're all clipped together and they all have their numbers on them. I have three boards here because there's 40 blocks. So basically um, each clip is one block and so I know that if I go down through my directions, this one goes to block 26. So I just move this board clip this onto block 26, put it back in its appropriate location, and then go to the next one. I did sort the um, little squares while I was cutting them, so I knew how many went to each block. So now all I have to do is just quickly grab the um, right stack, clip it, and that's it. So that's one of the fabrics. There's only, you know, 18 more to go, I think, at this point. So my goal is, and it's, it's a lot, if you try to cut all of this in one day, it is a lot. Um, but I usually try to do a couple pages a day, and then you can break it down. There's like eight pages for this quilt. So, you know, in four days time, I'll have it cut out. Um, if I have more time on one day or something, then I'll go ahead and cut, you know, an extra page or whatever. And I do just mark them off with a pencil um, in my binder as I go along, and that way I can keep track of what I have done and what I haven't done. Um, I also make any notes that I need to as I'm going along cutting, so that's kind of the cutting part of this. Um, I don't know if that's going to be like really beneficial for you or not, but hopefully you picked up a couple trips. If nothing else, just how to clip your blocks together, if for the difference between the piece and applique blocks, um, the bags for your applique blocks, and just cutting and, and just trying to think through um, the sizes for your applique in comparison to your piece and just how to kind of get those organized 
Um, and basically it's just going to take time. So you just start going fabric by fabric. And then when you get done, you have all your fabrics cut for the quilt. So then when the blog posts go up, you can just grab this, you know, the, whatever bag it is for that week or that day and um, get your pieces out, sew them together and um, flip them out and start applicating. Okay, so of course when I started to do this, the um, neighbors across the street are having their lawn mowed. So if you hear in the background, just know that that has nothing to do with me and you're not hearing things, it's just lawnmowers. Um, anyway, I just thought I would kind of give a last look of the prep and organization that I'm doing for the quilt. Um, and you know, obviously it hasn't started yet. So if you haven't cut out your pieces, you have plenty of time. I will tell you that this is probably my 10th or 11th quilt that I've done, um, with Lori Holt with the sew alongs that she does. And I'm definitely faster now than I was the first couple of times. Um, I still think that I probably have around 12 hours in prep work. Um, that includes tracing all the simple shapes, uh, making my labels, cutting the fabric, getting them all sorted, and getting ready and prepared for the um, sew along. I have not made my bias tape yet, but that is the next thing on my, last, my list to complete. Um, but I just thought I would show you kind of what I do have done, so maybe you can pick up a couple ideas for your own preparation. Okay, so as a reminder, this is um, this video. It this these tips and tricks and the concept will work for any quilt. Um, I mean, really any quilt. Uh, definitely the Lori Holt applique quilts. They definitely require some prep and some pre-cutting. Although you can do it as you go along. I've just found that it's much easier if I cut everything out in advance um, when it comes to sewing, then I'm not digging through my fabrics every week um, or twice a week or three times a week, depending on which quilt you're doing, because there are like, you know, 40 plus fabrics in each of these quilts. So it's a lot to dig through. Um, I purchased the kit. So I know I had a couple questions on Instagram about where to get the Lori Holt box. <laughs> this is not really a Lori Holt box. It's the hometown um, quilt kit. This one came from Fat Quarter Shop. So it, all of the fabric was um, cut for me in the increments that I needed. Obviously I had to pre-cut it down to the individual block sizes that I need. So in this box, what I have left is the So Simple Shapes, um, which were purchased separately. And depending on the quilt shop, some quilt shops you will actually have an option to build, um, to buy the Simple Shapes with your kit. Um, other quilt shops you don't. Uh, Fat Quarter Shop, you don't um, purchase the Simple Shapes with your kit. They don't, they're not coming in the kit. Um, so I just purchased those separately. So, and as a reminder, this is the first thing I did, and maybe I should add about half an hour for this, um, for prep work. Um, I use a library ring, so it's just one of those, um, you know, the little library rings, not the split ring like a keychain, but a, an actual library ring. Um, and then I punch a hole in the topper that the, of the bag that the So Simple Shapes comes in. And then I use the crop a dial, but a paper punch would work um, to punch a hole in each one of the shapes. And then I put them in order on the ring. And then this is where they'll stay. So if I, you know, lose a piece or I need an extra, or if I'm gonna use these for another quilt in the future, they're all here in order and I can use my So Simple Shapes guides to kind of find the shape and then since they're in numerical order, quick and easy to find this in the future. So that's in my box for right now and I showed the binder earlier that I keep those in with the um, plastic envelopes. So that's where to go when I'm done with the quilt. I just don't put them away until I'm done just in case I need to cut another piece or retrace a shape or you know something like that. I just don't do that. 
Then I told you that the first thing I do when I get my kit is I go through and I order my fabrics in the same order as the cutting guide. Um, so now that I'm done cutting my fabrics, they're back in the box in that same order. I keep them in order as I'm cutting them. I just stack them um, kind of like, you know, reverse order. I just stack them in a, a tote. And then when I get all of them cut, I just take it and flip it. And then they're all in the same order as a cutting guide. So if I'm, when the sew along is going on, if I'm missing a piece or I miscut something or there was a mistake, I need more or less or whatever happened, um, I can refer to the cutting guide to see where that fabric is and quickly go through my stack and find it. And this also helps speed up um, just, you know, finding your fabrics in the future. Okay, and then the fabrics will stay in this box again until I'm done with the quilt. And at that point, I'll go back through them. Um, I typically get rid of like little pieces. When I'm cutting, if I have something that's like, you know, an inch by whatever, I usually keep a one and a half inch squares and bigger. So even if I've cut something out, um, if I have those pieces left, I put them and I fold them up in the piece of fabric and put them in the stack. Just in case I cut four, I need five or whatever, right? So um, they're all in there. After the quilt is done, then I'll go back through them, discard any little pieces of fabric that I know I won't use, or I'll put them in my totes that I have. I have a few um, pre-cut sizes that um, I keep on hand. So if they fit in those, then I'll put them in there. Otherwise, they get discarded. And then I fold them all nice and neat, and I stack them together um, and label the bundle. So if I want to, I mean, I typically make another quilt with the leftover fabrics. So um, that way they're all together and I don't like um, miss any or, you know, lose any of those fabrics. So that's where these will stay. And let me put my So Simple Shapes back in here real quick so I don't forget. All right. So that's the kit. And I just, like I said, I just kind of... Um, leave it until I'm done with the quilt just in case I need this the shapes or the fabric uh, I have a rolling cart that I don't here let me I have a rolling cart here um, there's space on the bottom shelf of it that I usually just stick that box until um, I'm done with the sew along all right the so the um, sew along guide itself I do have it in one of her binders I believe this is the mercantile it's the hometown um, binder I just got this I've been putting this off for like ever and I'm just like I don't need one of those binders I love binders but I don't need another binder right uh, but I decided you know what I'm in a quilt shop and they have it and I want it so I'm just gonna get it um, her so the sew along guide is in this binder and it will stay there until I'm done with the quilt um, at that point, I take the sew along guide and I put it in my Sew Simple Shapes binders with that um, set. So that way, if anyone, you know, wants to, if I have questions and I want to make it again, or if one of my friends wants to borrow my templates, I do share those out um, with my, you know, local friends, uh, then I have this for them. Now, as I went through the cutting guide itself, I marked down everything that I cut. So I just made a little mark by the lines. Um, and then I keep this because there are things in here that you might need to reference. So like today I'm gonna to be making my bias tape um, and all the pre-cut sizes are here. Now all of those are already cut because I cut them as I went through the fabric. But there were a couple of them that I'm like, really am i really making i don't think this is the right size so i'll double check those anything that i have questions about they're right here um and then you also have the layout for the quilt and um there's typically yeah, some embroidery and trim um things like that so this will like stay out on my table until i'm done with the quilt and then we'll go from there so that is the sew along guide all right so there, for the hometown quilt, there are 40 pieced blocks and there are 12 applique blocks um, plus sashing and borders, etc., etc. So the 40 pieced blocks, as I cut them out, I used my design boards to um, keep those kind of sorted. Let me hold this up. 
So, and this is what I love about design boards. Let me look at this. I have this at probably a 45 degree angle and nothing is going anywhere. So it's awesome, right? If you haven't made any of these, check out my video on how you can make design boards with your sewing machine. No burn fingers from hot glue. Amazing. And I'm going to be getting, um, I'm actually going to get ready to make a few more of these today because I have three boards because I have 40 blocks, right? I have three boards that have um, pieces on them. And today I was like, you know what? This would be really amazing if it would fit inside one of my project totes. But these are a little big because I made them right around 13 and a half inch square. Um, so they need to be right around 12 to fit inside my project totes. So I'm going to make a few of those today and that way I can just stack them inside of one of these plastic um, project totes and they'll just be in there and be happy, right? In the meantime, they'll just hang out on these boards and they'll be on top of my cart until I get those design boards made later today. So that's one extra little um, tip or one thing that I'm going to be doing this time that I haven't done in the past uh, because honestly, most of the time, I don't have that many blocks to cut out for a quilt for one of hers, but there are other quilts I make that, that would come in so handy to be able to put those project boards right inside this project tote. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, so this is my applique blocks, and you'll notice that for this quilt, um, I'll actually have two project totes going, one for piece blocks, one for applique blocks, and this one has all of my applique blocks, plus it also has the borders, the and the sashing. The binding is um, in a separate location that I just keep just binding for quilts in those. Um, so in each one of these bags, and we talked, I talked about this earlier too, I label the bags with the block number and the name. So all of the pieces in here are for the um, flag house. So this is block one, and I have one for each of the blocks. So I have 12 of those bags in here, and each one of them um, has the pieces for the block in it. And then I also have a little baggie for the border and binding, and because, you know, or actually borders, um, like I said, binding is in the binding box. <laughs> so, um, but the borders, you know, those are the last thing, right? And I don't want to take any chances for anything like being on my fabric. I want to keep it separate. Plus I want to remember, oh yeah, this is my borders. I don't want to forget that. Um, so it's in a bag and then my sashing is clipped together. And this is all in the bottom of this one project tote. So I have the um, vertical sashing. These are for the piece blocks, the vertical sashing for the applique blocks. And then I have horizontal sashing strips. These are not, um, they're cut, but they're not um, cut to length. I have to sew these together and then um, cut those to length, which, you know, I'll do that at some point. This was not part of my, it was not part of my cutting prep. It's part of my um, quilting. And then the last thing that's in this box are the, um, let me see if I get these right so I don't drop anything here, are the background pieces for the applique blocks. And I just kind of fold those and put them in the bottom of the um, project tote. Let me see if I can hold this up. Yep. So they're just in there. Um, and then the borders can actually go underneath those because I won't need the borders till the very, very last. So. We're just going underneath those and then all my bags are on top. So each week, um, what I'll do is I'll grab one of the backgrounds and the bag and sew my shapes. Um, and then start doing all the turning and the shaping and the pressing and the applique. So um, I like seeing my blocks as I progress. So um, when I get a block done, I don't put it back in a project tote or anything. I just put it on my design wall um, behind me here, which is bare. So it's really wanting a block to come join it. One of the last things I do for prep work for a quilt um, that I'm going to make is I make all the bias tape. So as you went through the cutting guide, you were told different strips to cut, different widths. 
and at the back of the cutting guide it will tell you that you know you cut this width for this um, finish size bias tape etc and it goes on down the list I think it's like three eighths of an or five eighths five eighths of an inch for quarter inch tape and all the way up to one and one seven eighths of an inch for one inch tape so the last thing that I'm going to do is just kind of show you how I make my bias tape um, and there's nothing really special with it I don't think but I do a couple things that may help you if you've been having problems with the bias tape makers. So I'm gonna to try to move this so you can see the board and not so much me. Um, so just hang in there with me. Uh, some supplies that I have on hand, and typically I am standing at my ironing board. I'm sitting just so I'm easier to video, okay? Um, some scissors, some pens, I have a bunch of wooden spools. Um, if you're looking for wooden spools to use for your bias tape, then check eBay. They sell like lots of them for relatively cheap. And then I also have my iron, which is heated up, and my bias tape makers, of course. And I got this set on Amazon. I love the Clover brand products. They are really, really nice. But I want to try these too. And it came in a set and has a little tool to help your fabric come through, a little awl basically, um, all kinds of stuff. So this is really nice. And then I just have a label in here that tells me which color is which size. So that's um, kind of the supplies. Oh, and I also have Best Press in my misting bottle um, because I don't starch my fabrics. I don't starch any of my fabrics before I cut them, but I do starch all of my bias tape fabric. Um, because it helps it go through and have a nice crisp edge on the bias tape that you're making with your maker. So I have prepared um, this one fabric, which is going to make it one inch bias tape. And I cut the end into a V. And basically, you know, I mean, I'm sure all of you have done this. You fold the fabric in half. You snip it across the end. You have a nice little V, right? And um, from my little handy dandy guide, it tells me that the blue one is the one I want. And you just start threading it into your bias tape maker. And actually, I'm going to bring you over here closer. First thing I do is I spray down my fabric. I don't spray the very tip of my fabric, though, because it gets too difficult to get it through the um, bias tape maker when you do that. And then I just kind of slide the fabric in. And with this bigger one, it may not be a problem to get it to slide all the way through. Um, some of the smaller ones, it, it can get difficult. But I use a pen just to get that fabric all the way through until you can see the tip coming out the other side. Now, at this point, I flip it over because... I want this nice and crisp and I don't if you leave it upside down like this then you run the risk of sometimes when you're pressing you might get a little crease in your bias tape on the top and that's not good I don't want that I want it really nice and flat so I flip my fabric over my iron is hot 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 so then I just start pressing it and obviously keep your bias tape maker away from your hot iron because it will um, heat up because they're both metal. And then you would have a very um, hot little finger. That's not what we're going for here. All right. And I just kind of like to smooth it back out too. It's easy as that. So now we have one piece of our one inch um, bias tape made for our project. And then I'm going to see if I can find a larger. Yep. And then I wind it around my spool. And I do have two pieces of this to do. So um, I'll have both pieces on here. But when I have both pieces on here and ready, I'll just use a pen to stick it in the end. And now those are ready for my project. Um, I do have a cute little stand that my mother-in-law got me and I love it so much. I keep this sitting on a stand close to my um, craft table or my sewing table. 
and I just put the different spools around here. Now, I think I'm going to have more spools than I have pins, so I may have to kind of double up or something on this, but that's the general idea, um, and I'm just going to continue working through all of the bias tape. It's all the same process. Like I said, some of the smaller ones may be a little trickier. Let me swing you back around so you can see my face. All right. Some of the narrower bias tapes may be a little trickier to get them to go through that bias tape maker, but really using the same method, just get yourself a nice straight pin and just um, stick it in there and push it through and pull it through and get it started. As soon as you get it started, it should go really smoothly, especially if you spray it down with some Best Press or um, some type of a liquid starch. So I hope that helped with your bias tape making. And then I'm just going to wrap this all up and you should be good to go. And then, you know, the first week, each time I do a block, basically the first few blocks, I start pulling um, the thread colors that I need from my thread bucket and putting them in the top of my rolling cart. So then they're there each week. Um, and that's kind of where I do. That's kind of all I do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it sounds like a lot, but and it can be. I mean, it can seem a little overwhelming at times, but if you just take it one step at a time, it's it's very manageable and um, it's they're so cool. The quilts are so cool that it's definitely worth the effort and the time that you've invested in it. So if you have questions or comments, please leave those below. Um, please like and subscribe, share my videos and my channel with your friends that might be interested. And I really hope this has helped you or and answered some questions, inspired you to start your first or your 10th Lori Holt applique quilt. Um, or any kind of applique quilt that you might be doing, and um, or any quilt, really, because you can use this for anything. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for joining me. I will see you next time. And until then, happy stitching.